and I know it's a tiring on him and his family. And but listen, we have we have work, we have different situations going around life. But listen, God knows what we're going through. God has our back. Sometimes we just feel as though we're alone and we are going through this valley by ourselves. God has your back, guys, today. And amen. I want to give praise to him this morning. There's a verse in um, Psalms 100 that says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's what we're here to, to right. do this morning. Yeah. That's what we're going to do this morning. So get ready. Get your, yeah. I mean, put your hair up. Uh, roll back your sleeves and, and get ready. Because we're about to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Okay, amen. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not of ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This morning, I want to praise God for what he has done for us. I want to praise God for his guidance, for his direction this morning. Amen. We are here for one reason and one reason only. And that is the praise and worship of the God.
We're looking to you for our guidance, Lord. We're looking to you for direction, God. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. Let's go around some worship this morning, Father. You deserve it, Hallelujah. All that I have.
Amen. I don't want to miss what God's doing in my life. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Because when he does something in my life, I want to be able to be there to, to worship and to give him praise yeah. for what he's done. Right. Amen. I don't want my blessings to go unanswered. Amen. I need to worship God for everything he's doing. Praise God. Anyone has a need that they want to take to God in prayer? Amen. Let's remember J.D. Anna tonight. Amen. She's doing, um, she just went through this treatment this week. Um, let's pray that God will be with that family tonight. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, brother. Mary Beth today. Yes, remember Mary Beth. Amen. Amen. Anyone else today? Did you have a hand? Yes, yes. My name is Marna. Yes. And uh, I, I need a miracle. Amen. I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm testifying and saying already. Yes, that praise God. We'll do it today. Amen. Amen. Um, I had to travel. I'm sorry, I don't need to take that. No, no, please. I, had to, I came in from Peoria mm -hmm. because of a situation mm -hmm. that I'm having with my health. Yes. I can't drive. Amen. Come on. And Praise God. The Lord was telling me, you know, last night throughout the night I couldn't sleep. Yes. But he sent me somebody from Lyft. This young man is a Christian who <laughs> has a group of prayer in his church. Yes. And we pray coming here. So yes. Said, Lord, I know yes. I'm going in the right direction. Yes. Amen. So thank you. Amen. 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 Sis, come on, please. Come on up. We're going to pray for you. We're going to do something a little different here today in prayer for J.D. Anna. Her mother texted me this morning just saying that she was in pain. and They were coming to church this morning, but uh, she's up here from her grandmother's house, but she was in a lot of pain and crying. So let's let's pray for J.D. Anna as well. I'm going to call them and dial them, and then Sister Myrna, we're going to pray for you right after this. But we're going to dial them really quick. I told her to be on standby, so we're going to pray for them. I want J.D. Anna here to church praying for her. I think that's an encouraging thing. Uh, for that to have happened today. Are you ready? Amber, we're live. We're going to pray for you. The church is going to pray for you. I got you on speaker. Praise God. Lord, we love you. We thank you today, God, for your goodness and mercy. Lord, you see the need. You are a healer, God. We come before you, God. Truly the name of God. Believe in you, God. Take you at your word. Believe you, God. Not in your name. You see the pain that she's in this morning, God. You see the tears that I understand, Lord, that they have in her eyes. I don't know what I see. Leave me there. I don't know what I see. You're in my heart. 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 you are in my heart 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 you are in my he
Praise God. It's like you're on his have your way it's like you're on his story. God's doing the work. Hallelujah. God's doing the work. Hallelujah. Praise God. We need to know. Hallelujah. Our God's a healer. We need to see it. We need to feel it. We need to hear it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We want to see glory and go to the name of Jesus. James Corbin, uh, who's a missionary to Bangladesh, we support. He said 283 people across Bangladesh received the Holy Ghost like Pentecost. So thank you. I was uh, sitting, thinking on my way up to uh, up here that uh, the worst Christian song I ever heard was one called "You Got to Serve Somebody." A just terribly written song, but the message of it is absolutely right. That's what being a minister is. It's serving someone. And that's what the ministers all over the world, all over the United Pentecostal Church organizations throughout the world are doing. They're serving other people. And that's it's a noble cause. We'd like to, Sister Cheyenne to come and talk about her mission trip. Talk about what God and how the things God's doing out there in Costa Rica. You can be seated. I actually have a very brief video, but I'm hoping to put up to show you got that ready before I speak. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you, God. We love you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're awesome, God. You're awesome.
artist school, to borrow the cliche. Um, Costa Rica is a very interesting country. It all, The population is about 5.1 million. And to put that in context, the population of just the Phoenix metro is 4.9 million. So basically, the entire country is Phoenix, if you will. But throughout that country, they have over 60 churches and 33 daughter works. And the interesting thing is that in each church, like they say about missions, you do feel the same Holy Ghost. There were services, as you can see in those videos, everything was in Spanish, and uh, not all of us spoke Spanish. But we could feel the anointing, and there is yes. an amazing revival happening there. It is amazing. Um, over 70 people received the Holy Ghost while we were there. Yeah. 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 We lost how many baptisms. Um, and there were multiple healings. In particular, there was one service where a um, one of the AYCers went over and she just felt to pray for this woman. She never met her before, um, and this AYCer actually spoke Spanish. So she went over and she started to pray for this woman, and she all of a sudden she felt to pray for her for healing. Never met her before. The woman all of a sudden began to shout uncontrollably, almost knocked the AYCer over, because she had been praying for years for healing for kidney pain. She was in pain, doubled over in that service, and she felt the healing. And so um, they always ask me, what do you take from a trip like this? And briefly, the thing that struck me the most is all these little things that I've experienced in my life. Um, it really did prepare me for the, just this brief 10 days. I had several things, very specific things that I've experienced prepare me for what I encountered on the trip. And it made me realize that if God gets put through so much preparation into 10 days, what other things is he prepared for our life? Yeah. Everything yeah. is for yeah. us. Yeah. And so yes. please continue to keep Costa Rica in prayer. Please continue to pray for the Gwens and the Campbells, the missionaries there as they go on deputation as well, and for the revival that's taking place. Thank you. Amen. 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 Costa Rica. Amen. I, I don't know if I'll ever get to it, so I don't want to fly. She wasn't advising for it, but amen. I'm so glad um, she made an awesome trip. Amen. And you know what? Seeds were planted. I know seeds were planted by the river going there. Um, sometimes we never see the fruit of the, the labor. Amen. But by faith, we're going to proclaim it in the name of Jesus today. Amen. And something, some wills are going to start to be turned, and there's going to be something that's going to come out of that church. Amen. Praise God. God's awesome. He's awesome. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. Sis, I want to hear what happened. I want to hear your story, your your um, your testimony. Uh, Mirna, I want to hear that testimony. Thank you. Praise Thank God. You. Amen. Praise amen. We're, we're a church that sees a lot of things happen. Amen. amen. Sometimes it, it's, it's, it happens just to boost up our faith. Amen. amen. Your, your blessing could be for someone else. Oh, and you're just going to be able to it in that. Praise God. Amen. amen. We believe in God being an awesome miracle working. Yeah. Amen, Amen, God. Amen. Amen. There's nothing too hard for him. There's nothing too, that's why we, we don't, we're not both going to bring anything to him. Yeah. Because we know he's the one that created these vessels, right? Yes. He's the one that made us who we are. Praise God. He already, the Bible says he knows the end to the beginning, right? right. So if he knows that, he knows the problems that you're going to be going through. And as a child of God, <laughs> I said as a child of God, yeah. you can already proclaim that he's going to be victorious in your life. Amen. 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 I like to say this too, it's not the lack of faith, but it's, listen, even if things don't happen the way we want to hear in this world, I got promise that one day I'm going to walk the streets of gold. The Bible says no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. Amen. Praise God. So even if things don't happen, we're down here. Amen. In this carnal flesh, this body, this pseudo flesh. Oh my goodness, I have a, I have a, a prophecy that it's going to happen when I get up there. Amen. Praise God. So that's where my joy comes from. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's also remember uh, Brother Ralph. Yes. Um, he uh, is going through um, something. Um, um, he's going to get his results back this week. Amen. Let's pray. Let's special prayer. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's, let's have a special prayer. If we, guys, we, if we could just take Brother Ralph Gomez in prayer right now. Amen. He's one of our own. And um, let's just pray that. Um, whatever the, the situation is, amen, that God will leave it and restore him. Amen. 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 I know he had tests this week, and I pray that God 
is there for him and it's just amen that when he gets his results that there will be nothing there amen, amen. nothing there amen. praise God we saw him before if he did it before guess what he can do it again amen, amen. Lord amen. we're putting it in your hands right now God because you're faithful you're faithful God you've spoken to us you've shown us Lord you've given us God confirmation after confirmation to let us know Lord that there is no impossible for you Lord today we want to talk on our day today we want to give you God for the president of the for the mercy of God for the mercy of God for the mercy of God bless you Lord God bless you Lord oh you're an awesome God Lord we're going to give it to you Lord we're going to lay it at your feet this morning Lord because you are the Lord that's going to be one to talk about Lord, bless you this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God, Ralph. You're going to listen to us today. I want to hear that testimony. Amen. I want to hear the testimony. Amen. So that this week I have what? Three testimonies coming? Yes. Praise God. I have three testimonies coming. Listen, don't be shy. Amen. Be as charismatic with your testimony as you are with the worship. Praise God. Because sometimes that's what makes God want to do it again. Amen. When you get on fire and say, hey, this is what God says. Listen, he wants to do it again. Yes. Praise God. Amen. We want to go to, um, well, we want to do time and offering. Amen. Ready to go to God in prayer again. Amen. Just pray because I want to pray. Amen. Amen. Just because we can. Amen. This, this is our line of communication. So we should never take it for granted. Praise God. But anyway, um, time and offering. Amen. Those that are uh, giving online, we, um, we, we, we um, encourage you to still do that. Amen. God, you can go to the website, there's Cash App there, Great Commission, uh, PC.org, uh, you can go there and um, do what uh, you feel led to do um, in your tithing and offering. But we want to open it up here today as well, amen, amen. Tithing is a great, uh, is a big part of a church, amen. Tithing helps the church um, in its um, in, in their functionality, their daily functionality, their multi-functionality, the rent, that's how rent is paid, that's how different operations happen in the church. So it is an essential part of the church, and we want to uh, implore you to do that today. Amen. Give it to the Lord. Amen. Lord, I pray that you will bless all those that are giving online or in person. Lord, I pray that you will bless the, this giving, God. Lord, let it go to, Lord, your kingdom, God. Lord, there's souls that need to be saved. There's souls that need to come to this church, God. Lord, and I pray that you will open up and make room for them, God, through this giving for today. Lord, we're thanking you and giving you praise in advance. In the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Come give up to the Lord. Shake hands with everyone. Let everyone know that you're glad that they're in the house of the Lord today. Amen, amen. Somebody is going through that yeah. this morning. The Bible says that we overcome. 
Yes, come on. Some people don't overcome. Some people are taken out. Some people completely lose it. Some people check out. Yeah. Because they are overwhelmed. But the Bible says that they overcame. This is talking, looking back through it all. They overcame how? By the blood of the Lamb. Yes, he did. Amen. And then the word of our testimony. So a testimony is a great thing to have because it, it's what helps me to know that if God did it for you, the Bible lets me know on multiple occasions in the Word of God that He's no respecter yes, of persons. Amen. And because He's no respecter of persons, I know that if He did it for you, He'll do it for me. Amen. And vice versa. And this is what helps us to get along. This is what helps us to know that God is on my side. Yes, God is able to handle my dilemma. Yes. That God is working in my life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because when you make it personal, it's not just this thing off of the Bible where God did this for this one or that one. But God will do it for me. Praise God. And you know, the biggest thing you fight whenever you pray for somebody or pray for yourself is that little bit of doubt. But you have to push through that doubt. Yes, and that's where faith is at. Yes. Pushing that fight like that. Yes. In your mind, in your heart, pushing through that. Amen. And saying, devil, you don't get to have this Amen. one. Yes. Because right. he takes it that quick. It's that subtle. You don't get to have this one, devil. I'm not going to dwell on doubt. I'm not going to fall back into doubt. I'm not going to have doubt as my default. All right. But I'm going to go forth in faith. That's it. Right. Right. I'm going to push through Amen. what Glory you're God. saying. And believe oh, God. Hallelujah. Praise hallelujah. God. It's a fight. That's the in, in the battle, the spiritual battle is in the mind. And sometimes that battle is, is most intense in the moments where God is able to move. When you're talking to him. Amen. Then we'll say, oh, this ain't really gonna happen. You yeah. push through that. You're a liar, devil. Yeah. It's gonna happen. Yeah. Believe God. Yeah. And you push through it. That's how that's that's the battle. Because if you don't, you recount, you, you know, you, you end up. Falling back into this default position of, well, it may or may not, but God may. you got to push through that. Yes, amen. You know, the example Jesus gives when the man uh, comes to the other guy, his neighbor at night, when he needs bread because he has a visitor that's just shown up, he says the relationship doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, in Luke 18, she doesn't have a relationship with the judge. He's preaching persistence. And persistence means that you hang on to an idea and you don't quit. That's it. Right. Long after everybody would have quit, the lights turned out and everybody's gone home. You stay there with it. Yeah. And that's how we have to be in our mind and our heart. That tenacity to believe God. Yeah. To trust Him. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. is what gets the job done. Well, praise God. It's Father's Day today. Amen. And uh, we have quite a few people out. But praise God. We're celebrating fathers today. Some people are no doubt watching this. We have some people that have traveled out of town. Summer's like that. It's going to hit you vacation-wise, and everybody needs to get out of town. This is, I don't want to, I'm just not that kind of person that thinks everybody needs to be here every, in the summer, when you're on vacation only. Now, I'm not saying stay out of church. I'm saying when you're on vacation or something like that, I think everybody needs to get away. If you can get away, you need that, you need that change of scenery just to, you know, for a week or two, just to get away, get your mind refreshed, come back here, charged up to do a work for God. All right. Amen. Praise God. But it's good to do that because when you get, you change the scenery, somehow your mind is reflect, refreshed and and you can come back and focus on things that you need to focus on. Praise God. But today's Father's Day and I'm going to take for, for my text today a, a little different um, scripture. But if you'll turn your Bibles to the book of Esther, I want to read, stand, if you'll stand for reading God's Word, but I want to read to you something from the book of Esther that God has laid on my heart for today. <clears throat> Praise God. Word of God is powerful, and the messages that God gives us that He conveys in His Word are life-changing if we allow them to be. We let God move in our lives, let Him speak, because God is always talking. Right. The challenge is to be listening, the challenge is to be looking, the challenge is to be sensitive to His Spirit. Praise God, because He can communicate some things to us that are life changing. Praise God. Read it out of the Bible then. How about that? All right. It 
So Esther chapter number 3 and verse number 15. The very last verse of chapter number 3. And the Bible says, The post went out, being hastened by the king, his commandment. And the decree was given in Shushan, the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city, Shushan, was perplexed. Let's put our Bibles down. And let's lift our hands up to the Lord. And let's talk to him for a moment. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and mercy today. Lord. Have your way. Touch and bless, Lord. We pray for your anointing, God. We need all the things of God. We pray for your anointing, God. We pray for your touch, Lord, today. God, have your way in all that's said and done, Lord, today. We pray that you would speak to us, Lord, today. Change us, Lord. Help our minds, Lord, to absorb what your word is saying, God. And put it to work to execute in our lives. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Give us the word. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. This, of course, is in the story of Esther. And uh, what's taking place is a decree has gone out. And there's a little background about this decree. There's a little background about how, what is taking place, how we've gotten to this point now. It's, it's the subtext of this, the main story. You know the story of Esther. And it's probably a strange place you're thinking for a text on Father's Day. Story of Esther. But there's some powerful things in this book of Esther that I think God can give us a message. You know, that God can give us a an understanding. And my my title is just simply this: What you tolerate in the present can annihilate your future. Hmm. All right. Praise God. Yes. Now, I want to say that to men today, and it really applies to all of us, but what you tolerate in your present can annihilate your future. Right. Praise God. Now, in this story of Esther, as I've said, there's a subtext. And really, we're going to the subtext that really becomes, you know, you got two things that two things in this story that then converge onto one main point. The story of Esther, the book of Esther, is so incredible because in the story of Esther, we see so many breadcrumbs that are dropped at different places. In other words, there are things that are in the book of Esther that you see a building towards the climatic events that take place. And you know, like in any good story, there's always going to be little hints in the beginning of that story that kind of make you think, oh, this may mean something later on. And then all of a sudden, it comes into to full view. And the, the point of the story, all these things, all these um, tributaries, all these, these uh, avenues all flow into this one main point. And certainly in the book of Esther, this happens in an incredible way. So this point that I just talked to you about, let's just kind of unroll that, unwind that, and go back into the story. We reach this point because Haman, a man that is prideful, and part of the reason he's prideful is because he's royalty. He's in royal blood. But he also has a grudge. And this doesn't come out until he's not getting the praise, the honor, the worship that he thinks he's due. The Bible says the king told everybody, I want you to bow down to this guy, Haman. He's my number one advisor. And so everybody was doing it. But one guy. One guy. Now, a subtext to that subtext. Another underlying story to that story. Mordecai, who is he? Well, Mordecai, Mordecai, the Bible says, in chapter 2 and verse number 5, let me read this to you. It says this about Mordecai. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. <clears throat> You know, I, I, I'm a writer. I like to read the writing. And I, I'm struck by some things that are written and how it's done in the book of Esther that you probably didn't realize. Because I certainly 
didn't. And so I really took a deep focus on this. God kind of put this on my heart, and I was like, God, Father's Day, Esther. Father's Day, Esther. Don't see the connection. Until he showed me. So let me show you something. In chapter, in verse number five, it's when it begins to talk about Mordecai. You know, the Bible's good at doing those genealogies, right? This one's the son of that one, son of that one, son of that one, son of that one. You go to Chronicles and put you to sleep. Yeah. But this is important now. Now, Jer is probably his father. Not really certain of that. No one really has a good handle on that. But Shimei is not his grandfather. Shimei is the man that was cursing David. When David was leading, leaving out of, uh, Israel, out of uh, Jerusalem, and his son Absalom was taken over. So Shimei, who's a descendant of Saul, is cursing David. And David's man, Abishai, says, he says, David, can I go up there and just, uh, King, can I go up and just kill this guy and shut him up? Because it was already a depressing time. He's leaving because his son has taken over the kingdom. He's being, you know, it's embarrassing, but also fearful and also hurtful and all those other things. And David says, no, 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 no. Maybe it's just God, you know, give me what I deserve. Because David was pretty low. He just said, leave him alone. Just let him, let him do what he's doing. He was throwing rocks at David's man. He was cursing David and all this stuff. And he said, just let him go. So I kind of give a hint. This guy is a part of Saul's lineage. And it's kind of odd that then another person in Saul's lineage is mentioned here. Kish. So the antecedent to Saul. In other words, his father. So you you got to back up to his gym, to Saul, and then you talk about his father. There's a reason for all of this. So it's a very point of reason. This is Mordecai. This is who he comes from. Mordecai comes from the lineage of Saul. Royalty. Mordecai comes from royalty. And Mordecai is the one that's not bowing down. Everybody else is bowing down. I would venture to say even Jews that were there, that were bowing down. But Mordecai I did. Now, Mordecai, of course, that name is familiar because his cousin, who he raised as, a, as, as his own daughter, so he was older than her, much older, but he raised as his, own, as his own daughter because her parents were killed and had died. And so here he's raising his daughter in the main story of Esther the namesake of the book. You can't really get through it without talking about that. So, of course, King Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, as he's called, he had a party. Now, this party that he had was for 180 days. That's half a year. For six months. He, now, when the Bible, you know, the word India, the country of India is actually in the Bible, and in this story. Mm -hmm. It talks about what he ruled. He ruled from India to Ethiopia. 127 provinces. How they broke those up. There's 127 of them. And so in this show of his you know, extravagant wealth and, and the, the territory that he ruled over, for six months, he gave this display, this party. And when that was over, then for a full week, he had a party just for the city of Shushan. And as that week was coming to a close, Esther, or not Esther, but he, he called for his wife, or the, the queen, Vashti, to come and present herself. Because the Bible says that she was very beautiful. So he wanted to show everybody. He wanted to show off. He had showed off all his stuff for six months. And now he wanted to show off his wife to his, his, his nation here, or at least his city. And the Bible says, she said, I ain't coming. Mm -hmm. He's probably drunk, but once again, he was a king. Now, the thing about the, the, the Persians here, because this is, this is the land of Persia, the Medes and the Persians, and they were very meticulous on their law. So what they had, they had a law, of course they had a king, so the king was the law, right? He didn't have a parliament that's stamping things. It was a king, whatever he wrote, that became law. And so even the king couldn't change his law. If he made something law, he had to go with it. Now, he could alter that in different ways, as we're going to find out, but he, when he wrote something, it was the law. And the, the Bible lets us know that he made a law then. When Vashti said no, vanquish her. He got some, some advice from one of his men, Nemukin. And this is all part of the hand of God. 
You see, the story of Esther, you know, it, it's it's there, but it's something that God put in place. Yeah. Because God's will will happen. Yeah, right. Nothing is going to thwart the will of God. Even your stubbornness. Even your decision not to do what God says to yeah. do. That won't stop the will of God. Yeah, right, right. Because now we, we bring into picture Saul. His part in all of this. Saul was the son of Kish. who's mentioned here. But Saul was the son of Kish. And Saul became king of Israel. How as he was, you know. He was preaching a couple weeks ago on Wednesday. And he said that Saul hid among the stuff. Yeah. He was bashful. Mm -hmm. But proudful. See? Sometimes people disguise what they really are. It looks like they're one thing and they're not. Yeah. It looks like he's shy and he's humble. No. Mm -hmm. He's shy. But, but he's also very prideful. Mm -hmm. Because when he gets in there to become king to do what God says to do with this twist. I'm smarter than God. I think this. Even if God <laughs> says that, yeah, I, okay, I'll take most of it, but I'm going to turn it and change it just a little bit. They kept doing this to God's commandment. Yeah. And so, God says to him through the prophet Samuel, I want you to wipe the Amalekites. Wipe them out. Completely wipe them out. One might ask, why would God make such a decree about somebody? Is there justification? Well, I'm going to show you that there's, there's both future justification and previous justification for what the Amalekites had done. And really, let's pull the rule off who they are. You remember in the New Testament, there's this, uh, this part where it says, Jesus says, he saw or Esau had a hated brother, and Jacob had a loved. And he said, why would God ever make such a, a statement like this? You have to understand what they do and what it seeds. What you tolerate today will annihilate your future. Yeah, right. It has that potential to do that. So Esau hated the things of God. Even a bowl of soup. He said, a bowl of beans, rather. He comes back from hunting. And his brother says, hey, not that he had the power to do this, but he says, hey, did you give your birthright? Beans? What does that birthright mean to me? Give me those beans. Mm -hmm. He treats it like that. And you know what? God's listening to all of this. Esau has that attitude. So he goes out and marries some girls, you know, and it breaks his mother and father's heart. Not because of their race. It was because of their gods. Yes. Hmm. This is what Esau does. And he becomes the grandfather of the Amalekites. You know, he becomes that, the, the one of the Amalekites. So when Israel actually leaves out of Egypt, Israel's leaving out of Egypt. Attack. And the way they do it is hideous. They go to the back of the line. They attack the rear. They attack the old and the feeble and the people that just were struggling to, to keep up. And God is incinged by that. This is a story where Moses goes up on the rock and he tells Joshua to go down and fight. And he, they're holding Moses' hand up and as his hand begins to slip, they, they, you know, the sun gets ready to go down and they start to lose the battle. And they raise his hand up and two men finally get the message Hand up. So they raised Moses' hand up, and of course, they win the battle. Joshua was very successful. That's what the Amalekites These are the ones that are treacherous in how they treated God's people that had been 400 years of bondage, and now God had delivered them. And the devil wasn't just going to let it go. Sometimes we think in our lives, I got the victory. So I'm not going to hear any more from the enemy. Well, that's a lie. He's going to be back. He's going to be back to destroy. He's going to have to do things to bite off at the back and make you think that, you know, I thought I had victory and, and now this is happening. Now that's happening. Yes. But that's how he works. Yeah. That's how he works. Yeah. But the Amalekites had acted in this way and so God says, I'm going to take care of them. And so when he finally had a king, Saul was that king, and he asked Saul through the prophet Samuel, he says, completely wipe them all out. Yes. And the Bible 
says, Saul went in there and he told his men, he says, wipe them out. And they did. But one person they left alive. The king. Agag. They left Agag alive. And the Bible says that Samuel came in. They left Agag alive and they also brought the sheep. And God says destroy everything. They brought the sheep back and Samuel, or Saul's reason for that to Samuel, he said, well, I thought this would be a great offering to the Lord. God said wipe them out. There's a reason for that. And if you know it or not, if God says to do it, you need to do right, that. Right. You know, our world, so many people are smarter than God. And that's the problem. Be, to be more something than God. To be more righteous than God. To be more smarter than God. And people are that way. God says, you know, through the through the, the Apostle Peter, repent, be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So he says, baptism is for the remission of sins. And some people say, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That doesn't, that, that, it, water doesn't save you. What's water? Stripping away, totally uh, you repudiating what God is saying. This is what God is. He's put this package together. Yeah. Who am I right. that I've been here just, in my case, 53 years, to pull that apart and say, oh, I know better than God. That's right. And that's why judgment's going to be a sad occasion for a lot of people when they find out, guess what? God is actually the smartest one in the world. Yeah, right. Amen. Yeah. 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 But the Amalekites had acted in such a way, now Saul had acted in such a way. He left the king alive, and more than likely, he left the king's family alive. Saul comes in, he hews the king up. Makes mincemeat up. He's dead. But the Bible never says anything about family. Not yet. This happens. And this is where Saul. It's just, he's just, and, and, and eventually God gets tired of this guy who, who follows his rules halfway and then does his own thing. And the Bible says he pulled the kingdom from Saul. It's because of this kind of stuff. But God knows when God says something, yeah. God has a reason why he says it. Yes. Yeah. Whether you understand that or not, it's really our job to obey it. Yeah. And see, that actually shows our faith. When you obey what God's saying, that actually shows your faith. Yeah. Because you believe Him more than you can figure it out. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so, in Saul not answering or not responding or not obeying what God said specifically to do, it created a situation that was going to come up in the future. But watch how God makes up for that. Hmm. You would think that, oh, man, he missed God's plan up. No, 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 no. God already has something else. Hmm. And the whole affair with Esther, the whole affair with Vashti, that whole situation with Vashti was God's way of getting in there and finishing his plan. Hmm. When this guy is spoken of, when Haman is spoken of, he is called an Agagite. Not an Amalekite, but an Agagite. And that being because he's of the lineage of this king, Agag. And so, understanding what had happened to his predecessor, and by whose hands it had come, there was a bitterness and anger. One might say justified, but not really, because they started the mess in the beginning. They started it with their... In, in, their unscrupulous way of battling. But really, they were relevant to, to Israel. Esau. Esau's people. But Esau had this disdain for God, and now his, his lineage had that same disdain for God and did this kind of things that other nations didn't even do. What you tolerate in the present will annihilate you in the future. Amen. Yeah. Praise yes. God. Yes. And that potential. What we allow in our lives, and as, as a father, if I make this applicable to fathers as I as I intended to do, but it really applies to everybody. What you allow in your life that you don't champion and defeat and get the victory over, right. praise God, your children will fight. Right. Mm -hmm. Your children will have to deal with yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. let somebody alive. And now all of Israel was going to be affected. They were captives 
in the nation of uh, in this in this uh, kingdom. But now they were all in jeopardy of losing their lives because what Naaman what Haman did because Mordecai didn't bow before him, he sent this decree. He went to the king. The king was listening to him. He was his right hand man. And so he says to the king, he says, "Listen, I'll pay ten thousand talents." You know, if if you into the king's treasury, if we can take care of these people, just allow everybody just to kill them, destroy them. Because they're they have practices that are and the king never even stops to question it. He just listens to what the guy says and accepts it. So now the entire nation of Israel that's been taken captive is vulnerable. Throughout all the provinces. From, it, from India to Ethiopia. Their lives are in jeopardy. And it didn't make sense. The Bible says in the scripture we read as a text, the Bible says that this decree, the day it went out, Haman and the king sat down to drink. But the city was perplexed because of once, once again, the way the Amalekite mind did battle. He was mad because somebody didn't bow down to him, but also because of what had happened in his lineage. And he says, he decreed this, and the king just as he decreed. Women, children, young and old. Your neighbors, not the person, not another country, your neighbors. Kill them. Destroy them. Take their stuff. In our day and age right now, there's a mentality that's been brewing for a couple of years and people are stealing and thinking it's okay. Just stealing and just going to a mall, shop mall and just stealing. It's okay. I'm justified. I'm okay. I can do this. The devil is a liar. Amen. The devil is a liar. You're going to steal wrong. Murder and anything else like that is still wrong. Praise God. Just because there may be a DA that's lax in a city that's allowing people to do stuff and not have a consequence for it, it's still wrong. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. still wrong. Yeah. Praise God. But the city, the Bible says, because they got that post, the city, the Bible says, was perplexed. I'm allowed to, I'm, I'm being ordered to kill my neighbor. The city was perplexed. They were all in jeopardy. Because of Saul. Everybody was in jeopardy. Now it wasn't, you know, the, God says, I want you to destroy all these people. He left the king's family. That's what we've surmised from this. He left the king's family alone. The king died, but his family. And here, years after, the guy's not even calling him the Malachite, he's calling him Agagite. And he has that hate. He has that same intent. As he said, <coughs> same mentality about God, the things of God, the people of God. Right? And he's willing to kill the entirety of Israel. Because somebody decided that they were smarter than God. Hmm. Somebody decided that they were wiser than God. Hmm. If you don't kill it in the present, whatever you tolerate in the present has the potential to annihilate your future. Right. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Some things you gotta put to death. Yes. The Bible says mortify the deeds yes. of your body. Yes. There's some things that you gotta put to death. You cannot tolerate. The devil wants to make you think you can live with some things and live with this and, and do this and, and there's a reason for this and there's a reason for that. But the devil's a liar. Yes. Hey. Glory to God. Yes. Some yes. things I cannot live with. That's right. Bro. Yes. Some things I've got to bury. Some things I've got to crucify. Yeah. So the Bible says I need to deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow yeah. Him. Yeah. There's a spirit of compromise in our world that wants to tell us that everything is wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. Everything right. can be negotiated. Mm -hmm. Everything, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and maybe you're not all the way right. Maybe you need to pull over to this. You know, and if you allow the devil to talk to you, He'll water down the word of God to the right, point yes, that it yes. means Amen. nothing. Yeah. Mm. Praise God. Amen. Because he's always about the subtle deception. He's always about the subtle deception. But you see, even in this, as bad as this had become, because of Saul's disobedience, 
And now this situation has erupted, and now the devil's got his punch in there. He has it on the law. That's how it works. The Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's right. So he, he writes it into law. So these, these Jews will not escape, but now I've got But God's always a couple steps ahead of them. Uh, uh, well, right. Playing yeah. chess while he's playing checkers. Yeah. yeah. God set this whole thing up, and who would who would you know that of all the women in that whole all that province, God opens the story up letting us know how many women that she was in competition with. Think about it, all the beautiful girls and throughout the entirety of that kingdom. And of all of them, Esther stands out way above them all. That's the hand of God. Yeah, Amen. Right. Amen. Yeah. It's the hand of God. He was setting up because he knew it was coming. And now she's in this place. This is fascinating thing in this story where she's in this place and she knows the rules. And, and so now the rules are the thing that is keeping her from doing what she has to do. She says, you know the rules. The reason I got here... Because Mordecai, you know, he's in sackcloth and ashes and he's like saying, hey, you need to do something. You're in a position to do something. You need to do something. And she says, well, you know the rule. The rule says that if anybody goes before the king and he's not invited them, they're breaking his rule. Unless he hands that sepulcher to you, you die. And Mordecai flipped it back on her and said, who knows? Maybe the reason that you're here is for this. And that's exactly the right you know, this story more than any, this, this story more than any, has bread, it's littered with bread crumbs. It's littered with things that show you what's about to happen. You get to tie it in so easily. Here's Haman. He hates this Mordecai guy. He got this law passed, but he also, in his backyard, built a 50 foot gallows to hang Mordecai. Subtext of subtext, which I didn't get to earlier. Mordecai, sitting by the gate of the king some time ago, Overheard two guys plotting to kill the king. Told somebody. They got word to the king. Nothing was ever done for Mordecai. Mordecai is restless. The night that Haman has that gallows built, it's completed. When it's finally finished, working on the house. It's finally completed. And the Bible says he goes into the king to get permission to kill Mordecai. This is the specific reason why he's there. Get permission to kill him. And the king's restless can't sleep. He says, read me from my chronicles. And so they start reading. Okay, this is what happened this particular night. The king says, wait a minute. What happened? And they, they tell him about Mordecai. He says, what was ever done for this guy? Nothing. And just at that moment, Morde um, here comes Haman. His trusted advisor, counselor, chief counselor, walks right through the door. And he says, king. And the king says, oh, just a man I need to see. What does, what does a king do for somebody he really wants to show appreciation for? Now here, Mordecai or Haman had just sat with the king. They just drank as they posted this perplexing document that everybody is going to have to adhere to. And he thinks for sure the king's talking about him. There's just no way that it could possibly be anything else. And so he begins to lay out this elaborate thing had 50 men running before him saying, this is what the king does. Put him in your best chariot. Yeah? Put him in your best robe. And say, this is what the king does for those that he takes delight in. And the king says, you know what? That really sounds good. And I, I bet for a moment Haman was like, wow, this is I really got it made. Yeah. I mean, I'm not the king, but I'm, I, got, I got it made. And then those words that become faithful, like a stab in the, in the heart. He says, go and do that for Mordecai. Mordecai! <laughs> he's shocked. I mean, he, he, he's totally taken off guard. But God has set all of these things in That's motion. Right. Glory. All these things in motion to even help Esther do what she has to do. So, he does this for Mordecai and he comes home and his wife says, ah, oh, this is a bad sign. If, that, if that's the Jew and that's just, that's he's from those people, it started to go against you and it ain't going to end well. So she prophesies to him. But God had all of these things 
in his hands. He had all of these things in the mix. He had all these things already prepared. He knew what was happening. When, when Saul decided to do what he did, yeah. God still had a provision. Yeah. Amen. And that's why I'm saying God's will will always get done. But always. here's the thing about you and I. Here's what we have to remember. What I allow, what I tolerate in my life, I violate my future. Whether that be my children or even my own future. I don't want anything in my life. I don't want to accept anything in my life. I don't want to, I don't want to, to, to invest in anything in my life or allow Satan to have a hold of my life yeah. that he can destroy me with. Because he doesn't play fair. Just one descendant. You know, they say the terrorists are patient. They say they're very patient. Some of God was very, very patient. Very, very patient. 1993, they did a test. I remember that. You remember that, 1993? World Trade Center? They used a car. Went to the parking lot, bombed it. A few people died. This was testing some things out. And they wait a full, I guess, seven years. And they then unleash that deadly plan on 9-11. Satan's patient too. He's playing a long game. And if you'll let him hang around, all it took is just one descent of this guy's hanging, hanging around. And just one person rose to power. Satan's behind that. He threatened to wipe out the entirety of the They've already been destroyed. They've already been taken captive. But now the remnant of this world entirely was threatened. Satan doesn't care a thing. Right? That's right. That's, right. That's why Jesus, when he exposed him, he says, that thief comes for us to steal, to kill. And he's not satisfied with killing you. He wants to destroy you. Yes. And yes. He yes. 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 Let's yes. stand this morning. Yes. What you tolerate, Satan will use to annihilate. He doesn't play fair. When you fall down, he'll kick you. He'll try to destroy your life. But every one of us in here today need to have this in our mind. God, I'm surrendering to you. Amen. Yes. Whatever it is that you want in my life, if you speak to me, if you tell me something, if you impress upon something in my heart, the Bible says, if God condemns you, if your heart rather condemns you, God is greater than your heart. Yes. Some people ask me things, and it's really their conscience bothering Pastor, can I do this or should I? And their conscience is telling them something. I can't go against your conscience. If God is speaking to you through your... This is the thing. God speaks to everybody. Yes. I believe that. Now, some people have walled them off and shut them down and all this other stuff, but God attempts because He put a conscience in everybody. He put that in everybody. Some people have silenced their conscience to a great degree. And, you know, the Bible lets us know that it, it can be, you know, there can be some calcification. You can become calloused. The sensitivity of your heart is completely gone. Yeah. You can't feel when God's trying to tug at it. I don't want that. Right. I don't, you know... And that happens from repetition. 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 You're going to get calluses on your hands if you play the guitar. You got that, you know, if you're putting your, touching those frets, after a while your hands build up some callus so it's not so sensitive. And that's fine for guitars, but in my life, as I'm hearing from God, as I'm seeking God, as I'm seeking direction, as I'm making choices, I got to be sensitive to God. I don't want to be smarter than God. I don't want to choose my way over his. I can't be wiser than God. I can't be, I can't have excuses why not to obey God. Because yeah. Yeah. Yes. the devil can lead me. I think I'm just making a choice. I think I'm in charge and I'm just like a puppet on the string. Being yes. used by the devil. Amen. And he has me exactly where he wants me. Mm. Jesus. What you tolerate Help us, Lord. Mm. can annihilate yes. your future. You're walking with God. You see, compromise, you know, there's a song that says it's a slow, I forget the words. Fade. 
It's a slow thing. It doesn't always happen overnight, so people aren't so scared by it. Oh, it's just a little something, and, it's, and you excuse it. And Satan's pulling you closer and closer to the precipice. Because he's trying to destroy you. People think that they're getting freedom. Oh, I want the freedom. I want this here. And, and Satan will always make it seem greener on the other side. He does that. That's his M.O. He understands that we're visual and superficial. Hmm. And if he can get us looking at the other side and drifting to the other side, away from the voice of the shepherd. What you tolerate can annihilate. Praise God. That's in your own life. That's in your own mind, your own heart. Whatever God's talking to you about. Hallelujah. All heads are bowed. All eyes are closed right now this morning. Praise God. I, I know. I, I, this happens to me sometimes. I was just reading the other day, and this, this scripture popped out, and God said, this is it. Didn't really understand anything I was going to talk about until last night. But I don't know. God's speaking here. God's saying something. You know. God's saying something. You know what that is. Don't dismiss it. Don't tolerate it. You know, Paul says that we need to mortify the deeds of our flesh. There's a carnal nature within all of us. No, you might not be doing this big, bad sin that would put you in jail or make you ostracize everybody who knew what it was. But God knows enough and God understands how this is a seed in your life and what it can actually spring up to. And so he asks you. And so he comes with, through me with this word saying, don't tolerate it. Because that thing can annihilate your future. The enemy will use it. He will use anything he can. All he needs is just one. That's all he needed. Just one of the descendants of Agai. Of Agai, rather. Just one of those descendants. Just one. With the devious intent in his heart and mind. That's all he needed. Just one. Just one. And so when God says to crucify it, when God says to pick up your cross, you need to, there's some things in your life you need to crucify. Reckon it dead and say, I'm going to follow him. It's unnatural, you know, for me to do this. You know, the Bible lets us know that when, when they got ready, when the Philistines got tired of the Ark of the Covenant being in Philistine, they got tired of all the damage that it was causing because they had the, the presence, the uh, Ark that represented the presence of God, they had it there. They took two cows that had just given birth. And they set it on a cart to watch what those cows would do. Now, the natural instinct would have those cows going back to their, their kind that had just been born. But the Spirit of God made a push against the natural instinct. And in this place this morning, I'm asking the Spirit of God to work in our hearts and our minds. To push against the natural yearning, the natural intent the carnal nature that is not subject to God, nor can it be something the Bible lets us know. To push against that and let us be led of the Spirit. Praise God. Lord, I love you today. I thank you, Lord, for your people. I thank you for your word that's so powerful that helps us to crystallize, Lord God, our understanding of you and things, God, that normally we wouldn't understand. But when you begin to speak to us, God, you have a way of putting things together. You have a way of speaking and saying things and speaking into our lives and hearts, God, that helps us to have direction, that helps us to know the way that you want us to go. You remove ambiguity. You remove all those doubts and all those questions and all those fears because you take it one step at a time. Your word is a lamp to our feet. And it is a light to our path, giving us the direction we should go with every Have your way today. Oh God, have your way in me, God. I want to listen, God. I want to be sensitive enough, Lord God, to move in a direction, God, that you're pushing me. Oh God, I want to move in a direction that your spirit is saying. God, I want to do what you're saying to do, God. I don't want to buck 
Lord God, what you're saying with my own will, with my own desire, with my own ideas. I don't want to be smarter than you. I don't want to be wise in my own eyes, Lord God. But I want to surrender and yield myself to you. To you. Because you know the way that I take God. You said it's not in man that has the ability to decide and choose where he's going to go. But a good man's steps are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Have your way today, Lord God, in the lives, in the hearts, in the minds, and the desires of your people. Oh God, I pray today, Lord, for your touch, Lord. I pray, Lord God, for your word to be our guide. I pray, God, that there will be a yielding of our spirits to you. And to allow you, God, to do the work of leading us, God, as you will. Hallelujah, God. I worship and honor you today. I honor you today, Lord. I need you, God. Without you, Lord God, I can do nothing, God. But with you, I can do all things. Because it's you that provides the power, the strength, God. It's you, God, that gives me direction. It's you, God, that helps me to know that the way that I'm walking is right. Hallelujah, God. I need you every hour. These altars are open, hallelujah, for anybody that wants to talk to Him right now. God, I need you, Lord, and without you, Lord God, I'm lost. Without you, Lord God, I'm lost. Without you, I don't know the direction I can take, God. I don't know which way to go. But God, with you, Lord God, I know that I can do all things because you provide the strength. You're the strength of my life. You're my help. You're my hope, God. You're my salvation. You're my peace, Lord. Hallelujah. You're everything that I need, God. Hallelujah, I'm leaning on you. I'm trusting in you, God. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I'm trusting in you, God. Because you know the way that I take. You've set out the course, God.